a very warm welcome to Musically Speaking and thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you also for watching in such numbers over the last few weeks. The viewership is in the hundreds of thousands and I hope that these conversations have proved interesting, rewarding and insightful during these challenging times. For those of you tuning in for the first time, my name is Alexander Shelley. I'm the Music Director of Canada's National Arts Centre Orchestra based in Ottawa, the nation's capital just across the road from Parliament at Canada's uh, flagship performing arts institution, the National Arts Centre. I'm speaking to you from uh, London, England, my hometown where I've been since the beginning of lockdown, and on behalf of the orchestra and the administration of the NAC, um, I send you my very warmest wishes and our warmest wishes to you, our audience. We miss you very much and a very warm welcome to those of you who are visiting for the first time. Uh, in this Musically Speaking series, I have welcomed stars of the music world with a particular focus on Canada. James Ennis, Gabriela Montero, Misha Brugger Gossman, Jan Leszczewski, Jeremy Dutcher have all been my guests. And last week, uh, Canada's Governor General, Her Excellency the Right Honourable Julie Payette, was with us. Uh, we talk and we listen to music and we also try to feel your questions as we go. So please do uh, write to us in the chat box and my wonderful assistant, uh, Kelly Simmons, who's producing behind the scenes, will pass on the questions. This week, uh, we are in partnership with our friends at the German Embassy, uh, and we're celebrating at the NAC the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. And I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming a very, very special guest and a dear friend today uh, as part of that celebration. And before I give a brief outline of his extraordinary career and introduce him, we have something a little different today, which is a message from our esteemed friend, the German ambassador to Canada, Her Excellency Sabina Sparwasser, and she's going to set the scene with a little video for us. We're celebrating the 250th birthday of a genius, Ludwig van Beethoven, born in 1770 in Bonn in the Rhineland. Uh, Beethoven's music transcends time and space. It's forever modern, it's complex, it's very emotional, and it's utterly gripping. To this day, Beethoven is uh, the most performed classical composer. And he's a composer with a cosmopolitan message. Beethoven's Ninth, with its ode to joy, calls for the unity of all men. It is a very strong message. It's one that has become the anthem of the European Union. It is this message that Angela Merkel chose for a performance of the symphony at the G20 summit in Hamburg, and she had all the leaders listen to this message of unity of all men. Uh, we're very happy as the German embassy to partner once again with the wonderful National Arts Center. And um, we're also very, very pleased that Alexander Shelley is going to present today's interview with Daniel Ho, Alexander has been very, very closely linked to Germany. He was the chief conductor of the Nuremberg Symphony. He um, has a very strong link to our federal youth orchestra. And uh, Daniel Ho has become um, uh, the international ambassador uh, for Beethoven. So this is a wonderful opportunity. Enjoy. The uh, international ambassador for Beethoven, what a wonderful uh, accolade. Um, he's one of the great violinists of our times, but also one of the most inventive and engaging personalities in the music industry. He was the youngest ever member of the illustrious Bozar Trio, with whom he performed over 400 times during its uh, final six seasons. And he's a regular guest on the world's greatest stages as a soloist. The winner of the 2015 European Cultural Prize for Music, previously awarded to Daniel Barenboim and the Berlin Philharmonic. He's music director of the Zurich Chamber Orchestra, of the New Century Chamber Orchestra in San Francisco, as well as the artistic director of the Fraunkirche Cathedral in Dresden. Uh, he's an exclusive Deutsche Grammophon artist, and his many recordings have won a wide array of accolades, including the Deutsche Schallplatten Prize, the Diepson Dior of the Year, uh, the Edison Classical Award, the Preacher Chilia, and numerous Echo Classic Awards. I, he's probably able to build a room out of them now, and Grammy nominations. 
He's a filmmaker and author with four best-selling books under his belt. He presents his own weekly radio show and spent lockdown hosting a brilliant new show on Arty, uh, which we'll learn more about during this conversation. It's called Hope at Home. And as the ambassador alluded to, our guest follows in the footsteps of Kurt Mazur and Josef Joachim as the new president of the Beethoven House Bonn, an honorary position at that wonderful institution housed at Beethoven's birthplace, containing the world's most significant Beethoven collection. As you can tell, we're very lucky to have an extraordinary artist with us today. I'm thrilled that he's carved out some time for us. A very warm welcome to you, uh, Daniel Hope. Well, thank you very much indeed. Oh, uh, I Alex. think you're muted. Oh, am I muted? No, he's sounding fine. Alexander, are you having trouble Hello? hearing? Can you hear me? I think you're muted still. Is that possible? How about this? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Oh, how come I can't hear you? Hello? I can hear, I'm muted, I, that's strange, I apologize, Daniel, a very warm welcome, lovely to see you. It's lovely to see you and thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. Well, I'm just reading your CV, it's, it's, it's one of those CVs that you sort of shrink as you read it and realize how little you've achieved in life. Thank you for being with us. I understand you're in Lübeck at the moment. I am, I just arrived here in Lübeck in uh, northern Germany um, to perform at the Schleswig Holstein Festival. It's a festival that's very close to my heart. I've been playing here actually since I was 13 years old and uh, I had planned a big celebration these days together with, uh, in fact, your predecessor, Pinkas Sukerman, right. uh, who was gonna come and join for a very intense weekend of chamber music. But of course, all of that's been canceled. And so uh, we've still managed to, instead of having 11 concerts this weekend, we're gonna have five and only artists that of course are here in Germany and in Europe and I've just arrived. Mm -hmm. so. It's so nice, when did you, when it's did nice you see you out there. Ah, uh, yes, quite. And, and when did you start traveling again then? I started traveling um, at the beginning of June, really, when the, the initial lockdown ended and when I stopped doing the television shows from my own living room. You know, the, it all started there and I was at home for, you know, more or less three months. And then gradually, Within Germany, we started to, to travel around and to bring the concept of the show to various locations. Well, let's, because I'm sure many, many viewers will know the show, but there may be some in, in, in North America and further field who, who don't know it. So, well, first of all, that must have been your longest period at home for 20 years, I guess. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, probably. I would say, you know, three months uh, at home was, was a luxury. It was unusual. But of course, it was also very worrying because of every thing that we were seeing and reading and our friends and family and um, you know, the, the harrowing images going around the world. So it was a very strange time, I would say. And you didn't, I mean, a lot of people were, were staying at home, staying safe and staying concerned for other people. There was, for some, the silver lining of time with family, which of course you, you had, but you, as is typical for you, by no means rested on your laurels. You had an immediate idea. And so tell us how that began, because we want to talk about this, this show that you, you created out of nothing, so to speak. Well, I was on tour with our orchestra, the Zurich Chamber Orchestra, at the beginning of March, and we were playing every night um, and playing to full houses. And at that time, the news was just starting to trickle through about the pandemic, but things were still open and there were rumors around, you know, would they shut down concert halls? Would they close the airports? Things were still open. And we had done 11 concerts night for night in every major hall in Germany. It was just amazing. And then I got back home on the 11th of March and um, to pick up the family. And I was on my way to Rügen, the little island in the Baltic Sea, where I planned a festival. We had something like a hundred artists flying in from around the world. And I was literally about to leave when I got the call that the local authorities had shut everything down. And then of course, everything happened that we, we've uh, become used to now, you know, suddenly 70 concerts were gone. Suddenly I was at home. And for two weeks I was at home doing nothing except, you know, spending time with my family and trying to figure out what to do and what the world was going to do. And I went online and I started looking at these streams and I saw everybody was streaming. And I thought, you know, this is fantastic. You know, the, this, this message um, from wherever they were, were streaming. And after a couple of days of watching these streams, I started to ask myself, what about the sound quality of these streams? Because, you know, classical music, as you know, is about listening. Mm. And after a few days, it started to bother me somewhat because of course a cell phone is a cell phone, yeah? But 
is could there be a way to do a stream that sounded as if you're almost in the concert hall? And that's what got me thinking. And um, Arta, the French German broadcaster, they'd been in touch with me at the beginning of March about something completely different. And in a meeting in Berlin, uh, the, the head of Arte said, what will you do if a lockdown comes? And I said rather flippantly, I might convert my living room into a television studio. <laughs> and two weeks after this had happened, he rang me back and he said, okay, would you be willing to do that? So I said, only if I can get really top quality sound. So he said, well, you know, I don't know how you want to do that. So I called Tobias Lehmann of Teldex Studio, who for me is one of the greatest uh, sound engineers. And I got him over and I said, Tobias, is there a way to make this really sound like a concert hall? And he said, I think we can. And so Arte jumped on that and said, can you start tomorrow night? And uh, that was, you know, you just build a set in your house. Yeah, and they, they sent over a team. At that time, we could still uh, move freely within the city. Of course, there was distancing and we had to limit the amount of people that were allowed in the living room. Um, we had to put the sound team in the basement. I had to move the mics around myself uh, because no one was supposed to touch them. And so, you know, I called it DIY television, do it yourself, because I was just, you know, learning by doing moving. I was, I was watching an episode where you had uh, Sir Simon Rattle on and, uh, you know, you, you, you performed and then you then you start, moved a microphone over to the back of the room and said, please, you know, welcome Simon Rattle. And you went and sat in the other part of your living room and listened while you played. And then you came back in and moved the microphones back. It's lovely and it's it's intimate. Um, and it, it I mean, we're going to talk about Beethoven in, in due course, but of course the, the house concert was his daily bread. That kind of intimacy being a, maybe not a room of that scale, maybe slightly bigger, but playing in that intimacy was, was daily bread for, for a lot of the history of classical music. So it's, it's wonderful. And you've now done dozens of episodes. We've done 60 now. Um, we, we did 34 live shows every night live um, in my living room. And then at the beginning of May, we finished and I, we decided, you know, I decided I needed my living room back. My family who had been incredibly generous, uh, you know, giving over our, our house uh, to, to film teams and all the rest of it said, come on, dad, it's enough. <laughs> and, you know, we thought we'd, we'd done that. And so we, we ended, we did a final episode, which was very exciting. And we did a big send off. And then um, the, the phone and the email just didn't stop. We had thousands and thousands of messages saying, please continue, please keep going. You know, the, the lockdown had more or less finished in Germany. And so we mm -hmm. took that as a, as, as a signal, but then people were writing to us from India, from you know, other South Africa saying, we are still in lockdown and we set our watches to oh. this PM and we want you to carry on. So- and You've had millions uh, of views, haven't you? We've had now uh, almost 6 million now. Uh, since we started and after that we decided okay let's let's take the concept and, and travel around Germany and go into buildings and halls and venues that are either still shut or that maybe people wouldn't necessarily have access to so mm -hmm. we played on tops of mountains we went into uh, yes. uh, factories we played on the television tower on the top of Berlin um, we, we played in a, a Belle Epoque ballroom that was open for the first time, you know. So we moved around and last week for me, a, a particular highlight, we went for the first time across the border, we went to Switzerland and we did two concerts with the Zurich Chamber Orchestra where we had an audience and we had the full orchestra there. So that was just a dream come true. I, I have to tell you, I, I watched that and I mean, it started off with you guys playing. It was, uh, it was Bernstein, right? That you were playing yeah. at the very top of the show. Live fourth. My, I got a little bit of just hair standing up on my arm to see and hear an ensemble of that size playing together with kind of verve. Uh, it, it was very moving actually, because it's, it's something that's disappeared. You know, we've seen a lot of soloists, sort of duos, quartets, trios even, but it was, it was a, a poignant moment actually. And uh, as, as with everything you do, you, um, you present it with such ease um, and you, I, I don't know, you, you're tireless the way you come up with these ideas, but then to create 60 episodes in this short period of time, um, I imagine on, alongside your creativity, you must have a team of people that you really trust and, and are able to work with um, to put it together, or am I, am I wrong there? Absolutely. I mean, without my team, there is no way I would have got any of this done. You know, it's one thing to have the ideas now the creativity but as you know it's about teamwork and it's about sharing and helping and people helping you so we have a massive team in the background to make this happen even the crew you know now we're with five or six cameras we have drones we've got dollies we've got the whole okay. thing up we couldn't do that in the living room because you know we were limited 
And yet, you know, we still had two, two people on the sound. We had two creative directors. It's a major operation. And so um, without the, the dedication of the production company, the support of Arte, which is a public broadcaster, you know, this is their, their great belief during this time more than ever is that people have a right to culture and that they fight for culture. And that's what we pay our license fees for in Germany and in France and in Europe. And that's why public broadcasting is, is so important, why I'm so um, proud to be a part of that. You know, um, I think that's something that we came together. Yeah, I, I, and I, I, you and I have both spent large parts of our lives living in, in Germany. Um, and uh, at least speaking from my perspective, that's something that I value very deeply there. That, that relationship of the state to arts. Um, of course, questions are asked about how funding works and it's, it's never a given, but there is a, a, an understanding that the fabric of society needs uh, a healthy artistic fabric also binding it together. It's a, it's a glue and that um, a lot of freedom is actually given to arts organizations to do what they feel is, is, is the right thing to do. It's um, perhaps, not as much of an ideological movement as it is in other parts of the world, the idea of funding the arts. It's more of a given. Um, but I mean, that's something one can come to debate. But definitely, the, the, the fabric of, of society in Germany feels like it does have arts at its core, which is beautiful. It does. And I mean, you know, the, the enormous budget that the mm. government gives for culture and the, the, the help packages that they put up immediately. Mm. Well, sizable of course there's always a question mark as to does that money reach the people that need it and freelance musicians uh you know always wherever they are around the world come up against major challenges mm -hmm. and that's the same in the uk even though the british government have now uh, given this massive uh, yeah. back which i think for the first time ever that amount mm -hmm. of money 1.56 million I mean, it's fantastic mm -hmm. but the question is will that you know only help institutions and famous venues what about the people that live from gig to gig Absolutely. and from the very first episode you know i try to encourage viewers to give money and to to, mm -hmm. to donate to charities and there are many wonderful charities out there supporting freelance musicians in every country mm -hmm. and um, you know we, we raised tens of thousands of euros which right. you know that's just one person but i think everybody all of us at the moment you know mm -hmm. You should be asking, what are we doing for the future of our, our world, our musical world? Because it's certainly never going to be the same again, that's for sure. Well, and, uh, we've uh, pointed out in these conversations before that if, you know, wherever you are in the world, whatever city you're in, uh, or village or town, or, um, you can reach out to your local arts organization, something that you patronize anyway, and you can ask that question. You can say, how can I help in this time? And it, it could be something mundane, it could be giving money, it could be uh, buying tickets or not returning your subscription, things like that. But I think it's, uh, you know, I can speak from the perspective of the National Arts Centre, the Royal Philharmonic. Uh, we're thrilled to have that conversation, to stay in contact with our patrons and, and talk about how we can together ensure the future of the arts. So I, I, uh, I salute you also for, for you know, using um, this vehicle, which brings a lot of joy into people's lives, also to try and, and uh, be active in supporting the industry. Now, um, with these discussions, I quite often start off with a cheeky little either or section of, of questions, just to kind of dig inside your, your mind That's a little bit. I know and love. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little quick fire round. It's either or. The, 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 the tendency will be one to say both to all of them, but if you can choose, that'd be great. So let's go. Mornings or evenings? Evenings. City or country? City. Solitude or social gathering? Social gathering. Head or heart? Heart. Home or on tour? Home. Dreamer or pragmatist? Dreamer. On screen or in person? In person. Listen or talk? Listen. Yeah, I find that one tricky too. I'm quite a talker. <laughs> <laughs> Form or function? In what sense? Sorry. <laughs> um, in the sense that if something is like a Jaguar or uh, not that a Mercedes is not an aesthetic, but there are those particular Jaguars where the door might drop off of a particular period, but, but they look beautiful. I see. Oh, I see. I now get you. Sorry. Um, form. Form. Um, old school or avant-garde? Old school. Cook or be cooked for? Cook. Okay, music section. John Williams or John Lennon? 
Oh, that's awful. I love I know. it. Oh, no. I know. I'm sorry. No. Okay, fine. All right, this is going to be hard. Mozart oh. or Mahler? Oh, Mozart. Mozart or Mendelssohn? Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn. Okay. Mendelssohn or Bach? Bach. Now, this is the kicker. Bach or Beethoven? Oh, <laughs> actually, actually, it's not Beethoven. Oh, well, you, yes, quite right. Uh, okay, now within that's Beethoven. No that's no disrespect to Mr. B. Uh, no. I mean, Mr. B, but uh, still Beethoven. Okay, and um, within Beethoven, his trios or his quartets? Trios. His trios or his symphonies? Trios. Last few. If you weren't a musician, what would your dream job be? Film director. What would you be least good at? Uh, engineering. If you could meet and talk to anyone in history, who would it be? Beethoven. You're very much on theme today, Daniel. I appreciate it. What is your greatest fear? Running out of energy. That's apt. Um, okay, and the last three all together. If you were going to a desert island and you had one book, one movie, and one piece of music, what would they be? Great Expectations, Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. Um, Beethoven Violin Concerto. And the movie, yeah? Well. Probably The Godfather. Nice. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> God, that was difficult. <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> so we're going to play some, some, some music in a moment, but I'd, I'd love to just, uh, if you will go back to your, to your early years, because uh, I suppose it's always a, it's always a, a, it's seductive to think of friends and people that you respect um, through the lens of their childhood. And, and there's so many aspects of, of you where I've often wanted to ask you, do you think this comes from your experiences and your friendships as, as a child or as a child or not? And the ambassador spoke of Beethoven having a cosmopolitan message and, and you know, you are in many ways the embodiment of, of cosmopolitanism, uh, not just through your international career, but, but actually through your, your family history, you know, your journeys as a child, but also then going back a few generations. And for, for those viewers that don't know that, that sort of mid to late 20th century story of your family, could you give us a little a sketch going into your childhood? Well, I was born in South Africa uh, in 1973, and um, my parents are, in a sense, the, the product of immigrants, of immigration. My father's side came from Ireland. My great-grandfather ran away from Ireland at the turn of the century, at the turn of the last century, uh, jumped on a ship and went to South Africa to join the British army to fight against the Boers. Mm. Um, my mother's family's German, Jewish, were, um, you know, had to escape the Nazis, had to leave Berlin and fled to the United States and to South Africa. So my parents met there. My father is a writer, Christopher Hope, mm. renowned author, and um, in the early 70s, very politically active against the apartheid regime. My parents were put under surveillance and their uh, phones were tapped, they were followed, and they decided this was not the atmosphere in which to bring up two young kids. And they were offered a so-called exit permit, which was basically um, a misnomer. Uh, it meant that you could leave the, the country more or less immediately, but you could never come back again and you had to submit your passport, which is what they did. And so we left South Africa and decided Europe was the place to be. The families, in a sense, would con converge back in Europe. And we had hardly any money in South Africa, but by the time we got to Europe, we absolutely had no money whatsoever. And we lived in friends' apartments in Paris, uh, in their attics, sleeping there. And then at one point, we decided to go to England, to London. My dad tried to get a, a job as a teacher, as an English teacher. And even though he'd had a name for himself as an, as an anti-apartheid campaigner, the, the climate as such in the 70s in London was very much anti-South African. So it was impossible for him to find any form of work. Mm. And it looked as if we would literally have to leave again. But the problem was you couldn't leave. We had nowhere to go. We had no passports. 
And so um, we had to find some form of employment. And my mother, who had studied as a secretary and speaks six languages, said, I'm going to get a job. I don't care what job it is. I'm going to get this family a job and we're going to try and stay here. And um, she met uh, the director of a job agency and he happened to have two very high powered jobs as part time secretarial jobs. And the one was the secretary to the Archbishop of Canterbury and the other one was the secretary to Yehudi Menu and the violinist. And the reason I'm here today and I'm speaking with you is because she took that job. She got that job as the secretary for Yehudi Menuhin and suddenly overnight our entire life shifted and changed and we grew up or I grew up in Highgate in London where you grew up um, where our, our paths kind of more or less cross even though I'm older than you are but uh, it was it was suddenly there we converged there and um, the other thing that happened which was really interesting is that she found out my mom found out that we were eligible for Irish citizenship because mm. of my grandparents on my father's side so we applied and got the Irish citizenship. And as a result, we got to stay in the UK. Mm. So um, the reason actually that all of this happened was because of the job for menu and because of the Irish. And right. that's the why to this day, I still have Irish citizenship because yeah. it's the uh, gratitude to that yeah. marvelous nation for saving us. You also, it's funny because I'm also, also Irish British. I also have a, an Irish passport and a British, but you, you're also now, am I correct in being a German citizen? I am since 2017. Um, we I've, played together that summer. That's right. In Europe, a huge open air concert, 80,000 people. And I think you've just become the citizen. It was the biggest concert I've certainly ever done. Yeah. 80,000. I mean, yeah. when you told me that, I just couldn't believe it. And then when I stood there with you in that front of that stage and 80,000 people, I was just, it was unbelievable. It was beautiful. Yeah, that was the year. And um, there was a ceremony where they, in a sense, they reinstated our German citizenship because it was taken exactly. away when we when we when the family escaped. And I think it's a it's a beautiful closing of the circle. When I when I think about that sort of seventy five years that it perhaps took for, for your family history to return to Berlin by way of Vienna and London and, and Paris and South Africa, I think it's 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 very beautiful. And you you talked about you wouldn't be where you are if it weren't for for that relationship meeting menu. And I want to talk about that in a moment. But I read a a beautiful article by your father in The Guardian, uh, which I found as, as a new father, uh, very moving, where he talks about ultimately watching you after this journey together perform on stage at the age of 15 and realizing that you were about to fly the nest. And, and, but he talks in that article about the work that he invested and he comes up with this lovely phrase. He said that by the end of, you know, traveling around to all these teachers with you in festivals and concerts, he became, in quote, a clueless connoisseur, which I think is a great term because he knew so much about the violin but knew nothing about music. He talks though about, or he writes about a drive in you to become a violinist. Do you think that was their pre menu and being in your life and that world of the violin being there? Or can you recall where that drive came from? I know it was there before Menuhin. I don't know where it came from, but I do remember telling my pa uh, parents at the age of three that I want to be a violinist. I was mm. very clear about it and nothing was going to stop me from doing that. Mm. And they, uh, you know, they, they took me to Sheila Nelson, who, if I'm, I'm correct, lived in the same street as you did in... Uh, yes, I think she did, yeah, in Chumley Park. Park. Yeah. yeah, and um, that, that was th this wonderful, wonderful teacher who took one look at me at the age of three and a half and said, I'm very sorry, but he's he's physically too small. Come back in, in half a year where oh. he can really hold the fiddle. And I saw these violins hanging up on the wall and uh, my parents started to take me out again. And I was like, what's going on? And they said, we have to leave. And I, I had a fit in that second on her carpet, poor lady. I went absolutely bananas. And uh, she was very shocked and everybody was very embarrassed and terribly English. And there was this little redhead screaming and saying, I want to play the violin, I want to play the violin. And I think uh, poor Sheila, bless her, just said, okay, all right, just to keep him quiet. She took up of her fiddle there, these tiny little violins hanging on the walls. Mm -hmm. She picked one up and she gave it to me and I just grabbed the thing. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, went for it. And, you know, yeah. probably sounded horrendous. Yeah. But that feeling, that same feeling, yeah. I have every single time when I click up that, open the case and I yeah. take up the violin, that same feeling is there. It hasn't gone. And that's 44 years or 43 years ago. And Tell so me, that, I, you know, that drive. I, I, love, is there. 
a lot of young uh, people we've, we've seen have been sort of watching these shows as well and, and sort of aspiring young musicians. How much do you think, when you look at students that you work with and, and, and uh, young, young musicians, how much do you think that absent that drive, it's going to be impossible to build a career? Do you think that that is, is the fundamental engine that will drive people or, or, you know, what's your take on that? I do really. I think that, I mean, of course, you know, as a violinist, there are many different options. But if you think you want to be a soloist or you want to be a chamber musician and you want to really excel at what you're doing, I think that drive is absolutely essential. As far as I was concerned, I learned soon, actually, 13, 14, 15, that there was more that I wanted to do than just, in inverted commas, play the violin. And that's when something clicked inside of me. That's when I got into writing. I got into thinking about presentation of music and, um, you know, all that kind of thing started to happen. But the drive, I think, I, I personally believe is absolutely essential, especially now. I mean, you know, look at the, look at the world now. I mean, I, I think there's such a question mark out there as to how mm -hmm. classical music is going to be shaped in the next 10 years. So I, I think that drive is so important. What is worth, I think my parents, uh, who are musicians as well, they felt the same thing. They, they would say to me, the drive has to come from you. If, you. if you want to be a musician, we can't, you know, you can't tell a kid to practice every day. They have to want to open that violin case or the cello case or whatever. But you, you, um, you talked about the other things you do. And I see, you know, in your mother, but most definitely in your father with his, his, his criticism of the apartheid government there and his, his activism through his novels and his poetry. And then most definitely in Menuhin as, as well, two potential role models in your life for going above and beyond the, let's say, core part of, 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 of work and being uh, an activist, a musical activist in your case. Um, and also in Menuhin, he was, I think, an early adopter, I may be wrong, of these albums that have themes and also cross over, you know, East Miss West meets West with, with Ravi Shankar and then working with Stefan Grappelli. Do, do you, again, consciously connect a lot of these activities that you have uh, with those role models or do you think that was also independent? I think it's a mixture of both. I mean, I was unbelievably privileged to grow up in Menuhin's house, which meant, mm -hmm. you know, I would spend long periods of time in that house. And people that came to the house to play were some of the greatest uh, musicians in the world. You know, so I got to listen to, to private rehearsals with Rostropovich, Stefan Grappelli, Wilhelm Kempf, uh, Ravi Shankar, you know, those kind of people. Of course, I had no idea who they were. Mm -hmm. I was a three, four, five, six year old kid. I would try to uh, steal the, uh, the, the end pin from Rostropovich's cello as they were trying to play the, the, the Archduke trio. And, they, you know, I, you know, uh, so I had no idea who these people were. But I, what I did realize was the sound that they made and, and the, just the spectacle of Ravi Shankar sitting down on the floor and starting to play the sitar and Ala Raka, one of the greatest tabla players ever, you know, taking out the hammers and, and the, the talcum powder and this smoke that was coming up. And then these gorgeous sounds coming out of those those people. You know, the violinist that came to, to visit him, you know, from, uh, you know, Guidon Kramer through to um, Leonid Kogan, you wow. know, these were unbelievable maestros. And, and the, the older I got, of course, the realization came that actually this is not just the, the guy next door. <laughs> these are legends. And um, to see what you believed in, which was that anything is possible, any musical union is possible. That certainly planted a seed, you know, in my head. And I'm sure uh, because your sound is, 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 is extraordinary. And I'm, I'm sure that at that young age, you must have had so many wonderful impressions of what truly beautiful sound is because you're able to, to conjure that in your, in your playing. I want to segue quickly um, to to your time with the Beaux-Arts Trio, because I, I, want to, I want us to listen to a piano trio in a moment. Because um, you were 29, uh, the youngest ever member of that esteemed uh, uh, trio that has- I was 27 when I joined. You're 27. And, and so tell me, how, how much of a role did Beethoven's piano trios play uh, in the repertoire that you had with them in those, what was it, six years you were with the... With the, with the yeah, it was almost, almost seven years. We did almost 400 concerts together. Um, and Beethoven was, I would say, the central focus of that. Mm -hmm. Because the very first tour where I actually jumped in, I, I jumped in at about a five day notice to play um, a whole tour of Europe. We did about 19 concerts. 
And in that time, we had a complete Beethoven cycle in Geneva at the Conservatoire and a complete Beethoven cycle at the Concerca Bar in Amsterdam. And, you know, to, to, to do that in any ensemble is, is kind of extraordinary, but to do it with the Beaux-Arts and jumping in as, as a 27 year old kid who hadn't really played that many piano trios <laughs> was, was total and utter madness. But Wasn't it one of those cases where you say, yeah, no, no, sure, I've played that one before, but. <laughs> you know, it was like, I got this call um, and from, from the management of the trio and they said, you know, you, have you played piano trios before? And I said, yeah, you know, I've played a few. And <laughs> Uh, well, I'm going to read you a list. I didn't know what it was about. She said, I'm going to read you a list and just tell me if you played these trios. I went, okay. And she said, the complete Beethoven. I was like, the complete Beethoven? Uh, I think probably, yeah. But, you know, uh, you know both Schubert's, Haydn, uh, Schnitzka. I went, yeah, the Schnitzka I've played. Um, and this was the program of the very first tour. And four days later, I was in, in Portugal, uh, the Gulbenkian, sitting opposite Menachem Presler and Antonio Manessas and playing Schubert E flat and Beethoven Archduke Trio. And so, you know, that was like the biggest wake up call I've ever had in my life. And um, after the, the sheer panic and the sheer madness of the situation, I started to realize that this is the greatest opportunity as a musician that I've ever had and will ever have mm -hmm. the chance to work with these two musicians and to go deep into the chamber music of, of these masters. Wow. Um, I started to absolutely relish it. And Beethoven throughout the seven years was a huge, huge part of what we did. I mean, we did dozens of Beethoven cycles around the world and um, mm. I got to, to really, you know, not just love, but to kind of digest that, lift that literature. Well, let's listen to some uh, music. So this is uh, Piano Trio Opus One, number one, uh, not with the Beaux-Arts Trio, but with you. Could you uh, just give us a quick introduction to the context in which we're hearing this? Yeah, and in fact, you know, since the Beaux Arts are finished over 10 years ago, I've hardly played piano trios. I, I kind of ah. needed a distance. And this is one of the first times, really, that I've gone back to, to playing piano trios. It's part of um, the television series we did. It's not one of the Hope at Home episodes, but it was a television special last month for Arte, where we performed uh, in Bonn, in Beethoven's birthplace. We played at the Redoute, which is a historic hall in which the young Beethoven, in fact, met Haydn. And that was exactly at the time where uh, Opus 1 number 1 was inspired. And so this is a performance of one of the movements of Opus 1 number 1, his first trio with Sebastian Knauer on the piano and Daniel Miller shot on the cello. Thank you. Kelly, please roll the tape.
Fabulous. That was uh, Daniel Hope on the violin, uh, Daniel Miller shot on the cello, and Sebastian Canal on the piano performing Beethoven's Piano Trio, Opus 1, number one. And I guess Opus 1, number one is a perfectly good place to start uh, with Beethoven. So he's 25 years old at this point. Uh, you mentioned that the, the seeds were sown for this piece in Bonn um, at his meeting with Haydn. He's moved to Vienna in the meantime to, to study with the Haydn. It's sort of on and off. Haydn was the universally, universally acknowledged greatest composer of, of the time, and he wanted to learn from him. Um, but at this point, Beethoven's not renowned as a composer yet. He's renowned as a pianist and as an improviser. Um, and, and he chose these, these three trios um, to be his, his first opus, very consciously. Now, what I find fascinating is looking at the way he, he seems to have worked, he kind of assiduously took the best practice, kind of the best model that he could find in a genre, studied it, kind of centered himself on it, and then took it in his own direction. And if you had to take Haydn's late piano trios and Mozart's late piano trios or Beethoven's early piano trios, could you make a choice there as which you had a preference to perform? I, I would always come back to Beethoven, I think. Really? Um, yeah, and why and is that? Would, that's not by any means, please, to, to, to belittle those, those maestri, but there's something about the Beethoven trios that I think just take you to a different world. And the interesting thing about Opus 1, you've got Opus 1, number 1, and 1, number 2, which are very much in the model of Haydn, as you say. And, you know, in those days, you had to go and perform for Haydn, and he would give you the nod. And if you got the nod, the famous nod, you would carry on and you'd be accepted. And he said of both Opus 1, number 1 and number 2, he said, very good, young man, I like this. And then came Opus 1, number 3. And he said, you shouldn't publish that piece. And Beethoven said, what, what, what are you talking about? And he said, I wouldn't do that. It's the, the Viennese don't have the ears for it yet, mm. which is a very telling comment. Mm. And Opus 1, number 3 is unlike any other piano trio in history from that moment on. It's completely radically different. Mm. And that was the reason I think that Beethoven, who was very headstrong and um, very upset by that comment, then said, "I never studied, I never learned anything from Haydn," and off he went. And you know, it was the the, the battles that he was going to lead. But there's yeah. the headstrong quality in Beethoven, even in the Opus One Number One, um, yeah. that excerpt we just heard, that long tone at the at the end, and then yup, up, 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 up. Exactly. You know, this this provocation in him. Yeah. Uh, one says of his improvisation that he would play for hours and hours and hours. And he would draw the audience in and the, the, the fine ladies of the society would then fall asleep because he'd play so quietly and he'd wait for them to be fallen asleep and then he would bang his fist onto the keyboard and laugh and they would wake up and be shocked. And that kind of image of that titan I think is very telling. Absolutely, absolutely. And so as a performer, do you find them when, even though they're, they're, they're created at the same time, do you consciously uh, approach uh, those early Beethoven trios with a different sound and a, and a different attitude to the late Mozarts and to the late Haydn's. I do, I do. I mean, I think of the Mozart trios that the E major, mm. which I think is absolutely staggering. Uh, the slow movement to that is is amazing. But I do feel them as three very different people. Haydn to Mozart to Beethoven yeah. could not be more different. Yeah. And in terms of playing, I do uh, always try and, and in a sense find mm. a language for each of those. But I also do the same between early Beethoven, uh, let's say the Opus 70, and then Opus 97, which again is a totally different world. Yeah, and this is interesting listening to that movement. Uh, one often says of, of, of Haydn, one, one reads and, and thinks of him that the kind of humor that he brought to music, that, that the ability to bring lightness to art music is a very difficult thing to do. But in that movement that we just heard, Beethoven proves off the bat, I can do that too. There is a, a, a lightness and a joy to it. But that raw, almost brutal color that you talk about, that is unique actually to him uh, between Haydn and Mozart. They don't have that same rawness. It's always somewhat cushioned in Haydn and Mozart, I find. It is, and also, you know, it seems as if, you know, by reading all three of those illustrious people, that the, the Music came differently to each of them. You know, mm. Haydn was a very fastidious and hard worker. If you look at, if you visit his house in Vienna and you see that how his day was structured from breakfast, which was allotted exactly in 15 minutes, through to, through to 
you know, it's in this almost a straitjacket, but mm. with grandeur and elegance. Mozart, as we know, was more of a party animal where everything was up here in his head and he just had to literally find the time to write it down. And often mm. it was at the last minute. And Beethoven seemed to struggle. Beethoven, you know, his father wanted him to be the next Mozart. That's the reason he encouraged him to go to Vienna. Um, mm. He wanted to be this star and it wasn't going to happen. Mm. Plus, then, of course, we have 1801, 1802, the emergence of the deafness, the Heiligenstadt Testament, and this mm. break with the world mm. that was obviously going to come at some point. And so that I think that they're, they're afflicted very differently as personalities. And I find, I mean, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because um, despite the, the sort of wonderful romanticization of Mozart in, in the play and the film Amadeus and the, the connection that contemporary audiences feel with the man Mozart through that, that vehicle, um, I often find that, Beethoven feels very connected to everyday life. When you think about the man, you know, he had to suffer with deafness. He was very politically conscious in a way that we don't really associate it with Mozart and, and Haydn. Um, when you think about Beethoven, the man, what are your thoughts? Do you admire him? What's your relationship to the man rather than the composer? Yeah, I, th I think he's a staggering human being. And um, there are so many anecdotes and stories, many of which he recounts himself. I mean, his meeting with Goethe and mm. he's, he's, he's they're walking arm in arm in the park, and Goethe next to him, and suddenly the royal family arrives in front of them. And uh, Goethe moves aside for the royal family and Beethoven keeps straight at them. <laughs> and afterwards he chides Goethe and says, you see, Goethe, uh, he, he succumbs to, to affection mm. um, and to this, this ridiculous uh, idea of, um, of monarchy. Whereas mm. I do what I do because I'm a musician, I'm an artist. Mm. The same to Lishnovsky, one of his greatest patrons, the man to whom he dedicated those trios. Mm. The famous quote, count what you are, you are because of birth. What I am, I am because of music. Mm. There have been and there will be thousands of counts. There is one Beethoven. Yeah. And that was somebody that, that was supporting him. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. you know, he, he was extraordinary, I think, uh, for his temper, for his forward thinking, mm. his democratic uh, um, questioning. Mm. You know, there was the famous uh, account of the Eroica where he, he crosses off uh, Napoleon from, from uh, as a dedicatee. At the same time, he played the game. He had to, of course, ingratiate himself with, with yeah. certain royalty to get further. He was also money driven. You see that also in his, uh, in his letters. He was human, mm. the same way Juan Sebastian Bach was human. And that's, I think, the one last redeeming fact for us mortals is yeah. that uh, even though you know they they were giants and gods, they were human beings. Mm. And that, that, I think. It's a tiny bit of hope. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. And so your, your role as the president of the Beethoven House, what does that entail? Well, you know, um, I, I was contacted by the Beethoven House a couple of years ago and asked if I would, you know, uh, consider putting my, my name up for the vote. Um, Wiet Zimmermann, my wonderfully esteemed colleague, decided that she had, had done her time there and she wanted to move on. And so they, they put up... Um, an official vote. And, you know, for me, the Beethoven House has always been about, of course, Beethoven studies, but about Josef Joachim, because yes. Joachim was the first president of the Beethoven Society. He was the one that actually invested so much energy in saving the birthplace, the birth house of Beethoven, in getting the citizens of Bonn together and creating real Beethoven Renaissance. Mm -hmm. So when this idea came up and when uh, I was in fact confirmed earlier this year, you know, I, I, my goal is to, of course, honor Beethoven to keep him alive, but to mm. also look at the legacy of the house and what it's done since its inception in the late 1890s, mm. um, to look at the, the connections between composers, to look at the pieces that Joachim had commissioned at the time, or to look at how he programmed Beethoven. He was mm. so ahead of his time. If you look at those programs from the 1890s and 1900s, mm. the way in which he would blend a symphony with a string quartet, a movement of a, a trio with solo Bach. Uh, he did what we say is, is cutting edge, but he right. was way before that. Yeah. And so I see my role really as keeping his legacy alive. Not that many people know about Joachim anymore. Mm. Uh, 
rather well, as it's, a, it's, it's a name that comes up a lot when you read around repertoire but it's true it's a fascinating personality like Hans von Bülow he's he's not particularly well known but he glued so many different artists together and premiered so many works these these performers are fascinating and, and you're right about the the way that the music was consumed we have a somewhat uh, inherited Victorian notion of the way a concert needs to be and it still lingers and it's frustrating sometimes because you look at the way that Beethoven's symphonies were premiered or his quartets and these were sometimes mammoth programs that seem really disjointed to our minds but uh, people enjoyed them and and they they had their place um how do you think because we're running out of time which is so sad but I wanted to ask you how you think that Beethoven who was who was, if not an activist in the modern sense, as we've sort of uh, mentioned, politically conscious and who it famously in his mind symphony tries to reaffirm the values of the enlightenment, which he felt were lost during his lifetime. I mean, he was delighted and then Napoleon happened and he felt that the, those values were lost and he wanted to reaffirm them with the mind symphony. Um, how do you think that the, the values of Beethoven and of Schiller and of those enlightened romantic artists have, have helped to define the fabric of modern day Germany as a country that we both love and respect? Ooh. I'm sorry, it's a kind of intense yeah. question, but I ask myself a lot as well yeah. that same question. I'd just be interesting to hear your thoughts on it. You know, um, I, I think that, you know, Beethoven and his, his ideals have always towered above Germany. Mm. Uh, I think that at some point they were misused, of course, um, mm. and abused by the Nazis. But I think the strength of his musicianship, the strength of his musical leadership, I think in the end does actually shine through enormously. And I think the fact, as the ambassador said at the beginning of the program, that the, the Ninth Symphony is used as the European he, uh, hymn, as the, the anthem for Europe about, you know, all, all uh, equal, everyone is equal, all brothers, all sisters are equal. I think that, um, certainly with the 250th anniversary, I think that there's been a shift uh, to try and understand more of the man Beethoven, which I think is, is really wonderful because one often has this one image of him, the old cantankerous Titan at the end of his life with a famous red scarf. And there's so much more to him than that. I mean, you know, he said once uh, there should be one warehouse, collective warehouse in the world where all artists go where they all deliver their art and they all collect their art from it. Now mm. that kind of a statement probably could have got him in jail in those days. I mean, right. that was tremendously forward thinking. Absolutely. There are certain things and certain strands in what he says that I think we can learn a lot from today, especially now in this very peculiar situation. Well, and, and, and this is perhaps a, a final question for you. Um, the, when I when we travel around the world, I'm sure you're the same. You notice that um, the, the the conversations within different cultures are sometimes the same, and sometimes they're subtly different. And um, we've seen in the last few weeks a very important global movement happening with Black Lives Matters and uh, Black, Black Lives Matter, and and then associated uh, local conversations in different countries about uh, identity. And something that that is um, an important part of that conversation is how also music uh, carries in it certain cultures inherently. So we look at Beethoven, we look at Western art music, and for many people, it's, it's imposing. I, of course, I'm a classical musician. I, I believe in the universality of, of Beethoven's message, um, but I also try to listen to, to these conversations and I ask my, I, I question myself, what, what's your take on in our era, whether Beethoven can deliver through his music, a universal message. I do believe he can, and uh, you know, when when I take my kids to concerts, and I take them to listen to lots of classical concerts and orchestras, if there's a composer that grabs them immediately, it's Beethoven. A Beethoven symphony, um, with the explosiveness, and yet look at look at the pastoral. Look at what he does in terms of nature, in terms of his message of nature, of how it's so important to be in touch with nature. He paints pictures like very few other composers. And so I do, and of course I agree with you, I'm also a classical musician. I, I do believe passionately that Beethoven has that message, but I've seen it across other genres. I've seen people react to Beethoven, the way Winsor Marsalis talks about Beethoven, the way that 
they all have this kind of respect. Sting, the same. Um, there's a very specific niche in there which mm. relates to these musicians wherever they come from. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Well, Daniel, listen, I, I wish we had three hours to talk because you're just fascinating. And, and this man, Beethoven, is, is, of course, a universe that's waiting to be discovered if you know any listeners haven't yet got into his life and times because he's he's lots of things he's he's fractious and there's friction in his life but there's such a vision of of hope actually and he's such a generous spirit and and of course an extraordinary musician as are you daniel i i wish you all the very best with your extraordinary work both on television and books and as a violinist um i'm so privileged to to know you and have you as a friend and I'm, I'm truly grateful that you found time to be with us today and can i just say because you've been loading on these compliments to me and how wonderful it is to see all the work that you've been doing not just now but since i've known you ladies and gentlemen i've known this <laughs> chap he was a very young man and to see the career and to see the oh. Uh, the amazing talent that you have. And I just hope that we get a chance to, to play together uh, Soon. again, because it will I be agree. a pleasure. And all the best of your orchestra in Canada and to everybody out there. Thank you. And so to play us out, um, we're going to listen to the last few movement, uh, minutes of the Pastoral Symphony in a version you may never have heard before. So this is uh, Daniel uh, performing in a piano quartet, uh, violin, cello, piano, and flute. Uh, in an arrangement by Johann Nepobunk Hummel, who was one of Beethoven's closest uh, friends. Daniel Hope, thank you so much. And here's Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony. That was the finale of the last movement of Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony in an arrangement by Johann Nepomuk Hummel, a dear friend uh, of Beethoven's, uh, performed by Daniel Hope, our guest today on the violin, uh, Daniel Müller Schott, the cellist, Sebastian Knau on the piano, and Alia Vodovozova uh, on the flute. A huge thank you to Daniel for having been with us, and a, a thank you to both the National Arts Center uh, for presenting this and to our close friends at the German embassy and particularly Her Excellency Sabina Schwabasser who spoke to us at the beginning of the show. Uh, we're so thrilled uh, to be uh, featuring Beethoven this week uh, at the National Arts Centre Orchestra, our musicians, our home delivery of uh, the free concert last night 
um, and today's conversation. Uh, I'll be back at the same time in two weeks for the final Musically Speaking of the season, but I'm delighted to let you know that we'll be continuing this format uh, in the fall. Um, and I hope you can look forward to that uh, when we're all back in September. Please do check out the NAC website, that's nac-cna.ca, where there's fabulous content uh, from our musicians on a daily basis, uh, their lunch breaks, and you can sign up for our free weekly concerts from our archives. Uh, just look for Mako Home Deliveries and sign up. If you've enjoyed this, please also do like this page uh, on Facebook, Alexander Shelley Conductor, uh, or on Instagram, that's Alexander underscore Shelley, or on Twitter, which is at Shelley Conduct. Uh, I'd like to thank Kelly Simmons, who's producing behind the scenes for her tireless work to make these things uh, happen. We had a quick switch of platforms before we went on screen, so it was very exciting today. Um, but most importantly, warmest wishes to all of you. Stay safe, look after yourselves and those close to you, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon.